Now it turns out that relative to the inner mitochondrial membrane, the outer mitochondrial membrane is a bit more permeable to many molecules. And specifically, it contains specialized proteins called porins that have essentially created little tunnels or pores for molecules to kind of diffuse through. So I'm kind of just drawing a representative pores to remind us of that fact. And it turns out that this carnitine attached to this fatty acid, which is actually commonly referred to now as an acyl, carnitine molecule can readily diffuse from the cytoplasm into the uh, intermembrane space here via one of these pores. And it's actually a, a bit unclear uh, to scientists whether it's the carnitine and the uh, fatty acid, the acyl-CoA, that both diffuse into the intermembrane space and then get kind of attached via this carnitine acyl transferase, or whether it's more like what we've drawn up here and that everything occurs in the cytoplasm and this uh, entire acyl carnitine molecule diffuses into this intermembrane space. So I just wanted to mention that, but in any case, the, the ultimate uh, endpoint is the same. We get this acyl carnitine into this intermembrane space via these pores in the outer membrane. Now at this point, you might be wondering to yourself, why did we go through all the trouble to create this acyl carnitine molecule if these porins are permeable to, to a lot of things, including even fatty acids? So why can't the fatty acids just, you know, go through these porins and, and go, get into the mitochondrial matrix? Well, first, I want to remind you that remember, we're only halfway home. We have to still traverse this inner mitochondrial membrane in order to get to the mitochondria. And it turns out that this inner mitochondrial membrane does not have these nice pores in its membrane, so it's far less permeable to molecules in this outer mitochondrial membrane. But what it does have is it has this uh, protein transporter within its membrane that's going to help us out a little bit. And this protein transporter is called acyl carnitine. So already it's giving you a clue that it's going to recognize that molecule acyl carnitine that we worked so hard to create, and it's called acyl carnitine translocase. So just like its name suggests, it's going to essentially translocate this acyl carnitine from this intermembrane space into the mitochondrial matrix. And to show that, actually, I'm going to go ahead and take a quick shortcut here and actually go ahead and copy and paste this molecule here from the uh, cytoplasm to the mitochondrial matrix right here. And I'll go ahead and extend our path right here from the intermembrane space facilitated by this protein transporter into the mitochondrial matrix. Now, of course, we're not finished here because we don't want to oxidize this entire molecule. We just want to oxidize this fatty acid chain to obtain some ATP. So we need some way to remove this fatty acid from this carnitine molecule. So remember how I said that we also have a carnitine acyl transferase on our inner mitochondrial membrane? Well, that's where this enzyme comes in. So I'm going to go ahead and abbreviate that now as CAT for carnitine acyl transferase. I'm going to put the norm Roman numeral 2 to indicate that it's uh, a different enzyme located on the inner mitochondrial matrix. And what this enzyme does is it catalyzes essentially the reverse reaction of what happened inside of the cytoplasm. So what I mean by this is that it takes a coenzyme A molecule from the mitochondrial matrix and in a reverse reaction, now our sulfur atom here is going to serve as our nucleophile essentially and essentially displace this bond that was formed earlier, so that we end up forming a carnitine molecule back to its original form with a hydroxyl group, and we also end up forming back again simply our acyl-CoA group. So remember that looked exactly like it does above with our acyl group attached to an acetyl-CoA molecule via the sulfur atom. And in fact, just to make that crystal clear, I'll go ahead and actually write out the full name below it. So re recall that this is the acyl-CoA molecule. Now before moving on to the oxidation step, I want to point out one more thing, which is that it turns out that this acyl carnitine translocase protein transporter is actually quite efficient. Because for every acyl carnitine molecule that it pumps into the mitochondrial matrix, it actually exchanges it for one molecule of carnitine. So this carnitine molecule that's produced by this 
carnitine acyltransferase 2 enzyme can actually return via this uh, protein transporter into the intermembrane space. So I'll go ahead and continue its journey in the intermembrane space and then out through the outer mitochondrial membrane and back into the cytoplasm where it can be recycled to help transport another fatty acid into the mitochondrial matrix. So that's kind of a, a pretty cool mechanism, I think. All right, so now that we've finally gotten our fatty acid into the mitochondrial matrix in the form of this molecule acyl-CoA, what happens to this molecule next? Well, using the enzymes found in the mitochondrial matrix, this molecule undergoes actually a cycle of repeating steps. And each cycle consists of four main steps. And at the end of each of these four steps, we end up producing one molecule of acetyl, CoA, and I'll remind you the structure of this molecule is a two carbon structure with an acyl group attached to a coenzyme A, like such. And each time we also produce an acyl CoA chain that is now two carbons shorter than it was before. Of course, that's because it's losing those two carbons and producing this acetyl CoA molecule. I'm not going to go in depth into these four steps here or the enzymes used to complete these steps. But what I do want to point out big picture are the major inputs and outputs of these four steps to get to this molecule of acetyl-CoA and a fatty acid chain that's two carbons shorter. So remember that the production of acetyl-CoA involves oxidation. So oxidation, we're losing electrons, which means we need the help of electron carrier molecules to accept those electrons so that they can shuttle them to the electron transport chain to produce some useful energy in the form of ATP. So remember, our two uh, electron carrier molecules are FAD and NAD. And of course, these are in their oxidized form. So when they accept electrons, they become reduced into FADH and NADH. And of course, it also produces a proton as well. And the, the kind of convenient point that I want to point out to you is that it turns out, remember, that the electron transport chain is not far away. The electron transport chain is located on the inner mitochondrial membrane, right? So that's quite a quick journey. And so these are readily re-oxidized to their oxidized form once they donate to the electron transport chain. And so this cycle can continue quite conveniently in this mitochondrial matrix. Now, as a couple of minor points, remember that we need some source of oxygen to be forming all of these carbons bonded to oxygen in each of these subsequent acetyl-CoA molecules that we produce. So there's actually an insertion of water somewhere along these four steps, as well as an insertion of an additional coenzyme A molecule for each subsequent acetyl-CoA group that's formed. Now, before we wrap things up and briefly talk about the regulation of this oxidation process, I just want to mention something that I didn't get quite the chance to talk to in depth to you about, but something you might hear when referring to this process, which is the statement beta oxidation. And it sounds super uh, intimidating, but it's actually quite simple. And so I just want to take a minute to just kind of explain this to you briefly, like what the big idea behind this is. So this beta oxidation simply refers to the carbon the position of the carbon in this fatty acid chain that's being oxidized. So remember, the carbon that's being oxidized is the C double bond O bond right here in this acetyl-CoA molecule. And so to explain this to you, I want to go ahead and actually, I know I've been abbreviating this fatty acid chain using the letter R, but I just want to draw in a couple of these carbon-carbon bonds here. So I'll draw in a couple of CH2 groups attached to the carboxylate group here. So it turns out that the way that chemists label these carbons is based on their position to this carboxylate group here. So the carbon closest to this carboxylate group gets the designation of being the alpha carbon, and the one, the next furthest one away is called the beta carbon. And of course, if you're further away, you also get other names as well. But just um, because we're talking about beta oxidation, I'll stop there. And so you can see that it's this carbon, this beta carbon. So in other words, every other carbon relative to this car carboxyl carbon here that is going to be turned into the C double bond O to form this acetyl-CoA molecule. So that, that in a way is, is probably pretty intuitive, but this beta oxidation is just kind of a, a fancy uh, way to refer to that. 
All right, so we're hitting the home stretch here, and the only other thing that I want to mention is how this oxidation process is regulated. And it turns out that among all of these reactions, the uh, rate-limiting reaction is catalyzed by this enzyme, carnitine acyl transferase. So I'll actually go ahead and write that up. This is a rate-limiting step. And remember, that means that kinetically it's the slowest among all of these reactions. And also remember that it, that's important to know when we're thinking about regulation because since the rate-limiting step determines the overall rate of this entire reaction, it's a good step to regulate, essentially to turn on or off. And it turns out that in order to figure out how this is uh, regulated, we need to remind ourselves a little bit about fatty acid synthesis. So I'm going to remind you of a molecule called malonyl CoA. And if you remember, this molecule was kind of a charged up version of acetyl CoA that was used to synthesize fatty acids inside of the cytoplasm. And it turns out that this molecule is actually an allosteric inhibitor of this enzyme. So I'm going to kind of just squeeze this arrow through to indicate with a red line and a, a minus sign here that this inhibits this enzyme carnitine acyl transferase 1. So how, how can we think about this? Well, the way I kind of reason it in my head is, is if we have a lot of malonyl CoA lying around in our cell, it means that we're we are making a lot of fatty acids. So if we're making fatty acids, if we're synthesizing them, then we don't want to be breaking them down. And so we can essentially inhibit the rate limiting step of this oxidation process to make sure that we have a net production of fatty acids. Now another cool thing that I think is, is, is worth noting about this type of regulation is that by using a substrate in fatty acid synthesis to regulate an enzyme in fatty acid oxidation, the body has essentially made these two processes mutually exclusive. So, so when one is on, so when there's a lot of you know, malonyl-CoA, the other you know, being, being oxidation will have to be kind of essentially turned off, right? And so that's, that's exactly what the body wants. It doesn't want to be in a gray zone. It either wants to be essentially producing a net amount of fatty acids for storage, or it wants to be breaking them down to extract all of that ATP from. And finally, the last point that I would make is that even though it kind of seems like a pain to, to traverse through all of these compartments to get to where we need to go, having these compartments makes this kind of regulation also pretty cool because by kind of regulating this oxidation at this step right here, which is, which is the key step for transporting the fatty acids from the cytoplasm to the mitochondria, we can essentially keep these, these reactions separate from one another, um, literally. So we're actually keeping them in separate compartments, which is a, a great way to regulate whether something is on or off.